Your style and your flavor make the city rock. They must say the season come out with a bang. Coach Minzy, best round here. Remember that. Welcome everyone back to the coach's desk. Um, I am your host, Coach Minzy, and we are pleased to be back here on a Tuesday afternoon where we're going to be taking it from track side. Yes, we have a special guest in uh, the building who we'll be having a conversation with. So I'm sure that everyone out there who has been waiting on this inf interview, the time is right and the time is now. So um, big up to all the subscribers, persons who have been, you know, supporting the coaches desk throughout the, the months and the year. We really appreciate that. Big up to the persons also over there on Facebook and the early persons who are on. Big up yourselves. And we will be getting um, started with the person that you all see. It's on the thumbnail, yes. And the name is in the the. the the title of the video so without um <clears throat> going into any any anything let me just give a little synopsis of of who this brilliant jamaican is one that will be talking to having a a, a wonderful conversation i'm perceiving that we'll be having on this segment of our uh from track side so gregory orton retired 400 meter athlete Yes, he retired um, 400 meter. No, Dr. Gregory Orton. So put some respect on his name. You see, I was, I'm, I'm always an advocate for persons who are involved in sports. And I've always said that they, they aren't at risk. These individuals are persons that are brilliant in talent and also academically they are brilliant. So don't get it twisted, people. Here we have a doctor, a former athlete, who is now a doctor. Um, he's a three-time Olympic medalist, world championship, um, Goodwill Games champion, Pan Am American champion, also a reputation as a scholar, as I said before. He holds a, a bachelor's in communications from George Mason University. He'll be telling us about that one. Yes. MBA from uh, William Har Howard Taft University and a PhD in business management from North Central University. He also established the Art Mentoring Group, whose vision is to improve people's ability to think critically and logically about their future goals. Dr. Orton's commitment to personal transformation is anchored in the most defining personal moments of his life. And you'd have heard uh, our special guest the last evening spoke about um, Dr. Uh, Orton being his mentor, that's um, Jason Morgan. So he has been doing a wonderful job there. Now, these he lists as Overcoming poverty in Jamaica, receiving an athletic scholarship to the University of Arizona, and continuing to work to receive his PhD. Now, this part of it, <laughs> uh, it's sad to say, but I mean, he received his PhD after his wife was diagnosed with colon cancer and died, leaving him to raise their two and seven year old daughters. Now, these are challenges that um, Dr. Orton would have faced, but um, he, these challenges have contributed to his ability to assist individuals to implement their own unique system for achieving personal success by transforming their minds. Wow, this is a beautiful story, but it, it is going to be even better when we hear it from the man himself, Dr. Gregory Orlando Orton. Come on, people, put your hands together, the virtual hand clap, put it together, and welcome Dr. Orton. Hey, Coach Minzy, thanks for having me on your program. 
Yes, you know, it's, it, it, it's a privilege to have you here, Dr. Arden. How are you, by the way? How, how are things? I am blessed, you know. I have a lot to give thanks for, you know, life has been good to me and my family. And I just continue to praise the most I every single day. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And we're happy to have you. Let me give you a round of applause again. Yes, man, a man of the soil. Man who has contributed to the Jamaican track and field for quite a number of years. Yes. So, Sir Arden, forgive me if I don't say doctor. I might say Sir Arden sometimes or Mr. Arden. Just forgive me. But I want to ensure that you get your right title. So I'm going to ensure that I say it three times so I can remember it. Dr. Arden, Dr. Arden, Dr. Arden. All right. So I think it's lodge now. I want you to tell us about your early life growing up in Jamaica, Dr. Hart. Well, um, before I, 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 I address that, I can say that for me, the title is not important, honestly. It's just something that I achieve and I use it from time to time, but I'm not really caught up with the title. I was born in Rollington Town. People who know where that is, it's off closer to Mountain View. Um, and I was raised in Alman Town. Uh, at 12 years old, I went to Alman Town. Well, I should say at seven years old, I went to Alman Town. And then I relocated to Seaview Gardens at 11 years old. And I was at Seaview Garden until I got my scholarship to go overseas. So when we talk about poverty, it's something that I am not ashamed to talk mm -hmm. about. It's not something that defines who I am. I wish more of the athletes who end up get taken in by some affluent guardian or friend or parent would accept the fact that poverty does not define who you are. It's very important. So I am never afraid to talk about it uh, and because it gave me that killer instinct so to speak. So when I went overseas, I was hungry for success. I would not negotiate when it comes to giving up the opportunity for, for pleasure. But my upbringing gave me that level of determination and confidence to take what was actually mine. And I, I asked, I, and that's, that's beautifully put, um, Dr. Orton, because, you know, sometimes, well, most times, the talented and the, the, the brilliant ones academically are from humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they say it is not who have the money will go to university. Or mm -hmm. it's not who can afford it goes to university. Is 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 basically sometimes the ones that have the talent and are given opportunities and they take it because sometimes, you know, some are given the opportunities and, and they don't take it by the scope of the neck. True. So we are happy that you would have fought through that sort of uh, a situation. How about your siblings? Were you the only one? Well, not really. I have three sisters. One tried to run. She was pretty good at it, but the dedication wasn't there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, But I, I, I was the only one in the family that decided to take up sports because I saw a way out. That was my way out. Oh, For them, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't as urgent to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get going and use it as a means to to empower themselves yes man and, and i trust that some young athletes will will be listening to this interview because i'm foreseeing some some positive thoughts some positive nuggets coming from this sort of interview um where you where you share your your life experience and let us start off with that experience you you made mention of you seeing track and field as the way out yeah um how did you get involved in it uh, talk to us about those early days in track and field well i was always a fast kid you know when i was at um exit primary at the age of seven i was almost the fastest person in school so you know I, a lot of people don't know this but in 1986 i was the all primary champion boy at um the primary champs mm -hmm. but when i reached to excelsior high school i started to waste some time i started to idle like most adolescents and i started to get involved in the wrong thing the wrong things 
So because of that, I stopped running track and field for a while until I was in Fort Farm. When mm-hmm. I was looking for a better way, I started to play cricket. Got and sorry, so, sorry to interject there. That's um high school would have been Excelsior High School, right? Yes. So yes. Big Excelsior. up to the Excelsior people in the building. <laughs> Go ahead. I love my high school. So I wasted a whole lot of time there. I started playing cricket. The manager for the track team saw me chasing after a ball. We had a home game. And he's saying, why is that guy not on the track team? So after the cricket match, he met up with me. He asked me if I wanted to run track. But a lot of people didn't know that I used to run back in the days. So when I started running on the track team, I started excelling real fast. But they did not know that it was something that I used to do when I was younger. So that's how I got the opportunity. But the, 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 the short version is I got called to play cricket the tryout for Jamaica and at the same time I made the national team in track and I was looking for the better way and I'm saying you know what track and field is an individual sport I think I could be good at it so I am just going to settle with track and field and I took the scholarship and I didn't look back since then so 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 you had the opportunity you see you're so talented that you had the opportunity in two sports but you actually was it a case that you prefer track and field over cricket or because of the opportunity that you saw. So it, it is telling me that where you're coming from, that the, as, you, as you made mention earlier, that doesn't define you mm. because you had things planned out at that age already. Yes, definitely. I love cricket even to this day. It's my first love. Maybe one of the reasons I like it because it's a, it's, it's a gentleman game, but it's an easy game. And because I was good, athletical in terms of running it was easy for me but i really love cricket i did not want to walk away from cricket but when i factor in everything and i saw that i had an opportunity to go overseas get a full paid scholarship for me it was a no-brainer and 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 this is where it gets challenging for some people because people want to do and pursue things that they like they love Cricket was what I love, but track and field offered the best opportunity for me at the time. And that is why I decided that, look, I'm going to put everything in track and field. And I, I don't regret it one bit. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So tell us about your, your, your early track and field. What did you do on the track? Was it 400? Was it 100 meter? 200 hurdles? Talk to us about that aspect. Well, and well, you like everybody, you know, most Jamaicans say that they are a sprinter. So I was actually a sprinter, one, two. Yes. And I remember they had a guy by the name of Michael Cowan who was the one, two, four guy. So they were looking to fill a gap. So they accidentally threw me into the 400. I didn't want to do it. But when I ran that race that day, I think I finished fourth. I think I ran 51 as a class two guy. And they're saying, no, this guy with no training whatsoever, He's able to run 51. This is the event for him. I regretted it, man. I said, <laughs> I said why did I run so fast? But it was just the, 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 the warrior in me where I just did not want to finish last. And I tell you, I never liked the 400 meter. Even today, I don't like it. It was because I was good at it. I just decided that, you know what? <laughs> Let me do it. <laughs> hey, you, you know that most at least as I know. I've come across even those like yourself who would have competed at the 400 meters. They dread that event. Mm. It's one of those events that are that 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 you you'd say you know very difficult to to, to run, much less the training. <laughs> Which means it, let me tell you that day when I ran that 400 meter at Boys Champs that day, it took me about two hours to get up really? off the track. I was dead. I couldn't walk. I couldn't roll. I couldn't move. And I, I, I felt so angry because I'm saying, why did they put me in this event when, when they knew I wasn't fully ready? And that was one of the reasons why I really didn't like it. But, you know, as I said, I'm a warrior. If I have to do something, I just make my mind up and I'm good to go. Okay. And did, did you um, ever made any of the, the, the national teams while at um, Excelsior? Yes. In fact, I was actually on the Pan-American team in 1991. And this is a story that I really never tell people about. But Talk when we were about on the it. team, <laughs> they picked me on the team and I had no uniform. 
So I had to run in a in a t-shirt and my Excelsior shorts. So I was in lane seven. So the crowd, the Jamaican crowd, did not know that I was actually running for Jamaica because I was in a white t-shirt and an Excelsior shorts. That was my first national team. That was 1991, the Pan American Junior Championship. I also made the World Junior Team in 1992, where we finished second. And that was the first time in a while Jamaica as youth started to dominate um, track and field at the youth level. And the, the, the funny thing about it, Coach Minzy, mm -hmm. it was the same set of guys that um, transitioned into the professional where we started to dominate at the professional level. Not, and Davian, if you're watching this, you know, Davian was also on that team. Carl McPherson was on that team. Edward Clark was on that team. And was it that same um, Carl McPherson that you, 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 you upset that chap, that <laughs> this, this person have it there on screen? No, the, the JC people don't <laughs> like to hear about that race because that, 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 that race was one of the defining moments in my life. Because so, Carl tell McPherson us about it, man. Tell us about champion. it. Yeah. A lot of people bet on Carl McPherson. A few people thought the Excelsior guy would do it. So, you know, a lot of people left that day very upset that Carl McPherson did not win that title. All right. So in, in, in 93, you went to um, CAC Games. Ta mm -hmm. Tell us about that. You, you won two gold medals. Yes. In 93, uh, you know, unfortunately, I finished six at the, the, the championship that year. Mm -hmm. And I... I, I wanted to run to redeem myself at CSC. I did it. I ran a season best. But the other guys did not qualify for the Stuttgart. So that, is what, that was how I got the opportunity to represent Jamaica in Stuttgart because they, we only had one person who, was, who had the qualifying in time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fortunately for me, I won the CSC 400 meter. Then we won the... Uh, the, the mile relay, I think it was close to a record-breaking time, CSC record-breaking time, and things just started to look up <laughs> for me. Yes. Awesome, awesome. And you, 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 you never did so well at, uh, at the world champion in Stuttgart. You finished um, um, sixth in the, in the 400 meters. Uh, was that the final? Yes, that, uh, yes, was, that was the final. Yeah, you went yes. to the final, yes. yes. And, and the, 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 the Four by four team finished um, seventh. Well, that was a defining moment for me too because mm -hmm. I could still compete in high school that year, but I decided to take the scholarship and go overseas. So, I, as a freshman in college, I actually ran forty four seventy eight, which was the second fastest time in Jamaica for a Jamaican at the time. So, Stuttgart was a defining moment for me. Because it started to open other people's eyes to say, this guy really seemed talented because we did not have a Jamaican running 44 in a while. And he came out as a freshman, a 19-year-old running 44-78. So, you know, Stuttgart is, some, is, 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 a, is a moment that I cherish. And you know, you know, as you mentioned, that most times when, when these young athletes like yourself in, at that particular time, they quote-unquote get a, an opportunity to, to represent the country it is mm -hmm. always a defining moment for some you know because they they, they went on they would have gone on the world scene and see how things are done so it kind of gives them a different um purview on how things supposed to go so they used to um chicken out in training you know the mindset i, I would change dramatically coming back from those um trips you see, Coach Menzi, I was a beast in a lot of ways. I was looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. I was seeking. I was searching. And, you know, like some people would, would, would um, sorry, not give the best of themselves. For me, I was looking for the moment to perform because I knew if I was able to, to establish myself that it would be good for me and my family. So for me... I used to love those championships. If you look at my history, you will see that everywhere that I went, I came home with a medal because it was a personal goal for me. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. only time we did not get a medal, whether individually or team, was in Stuttgart. And that also opened my eyes to make me aware that if you're going to get a medal sometimes, it's something that you have to do for yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
you 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 would have had um you spoke uh, you spoke about getting medals at at competitions you have pan Amer pan american games medal gold that was goodwill games in 2001 and nassau that's character under 20. tell us about those three gold medals well um the goodwill games medal is one of my uh most precious moment because you know, I was the favorite to win the world championship that year. And for some reason, I wasn't able to deliver. So I finished third. So I went to the Goodwill Games. It was just something that I had to do to redeem myself. Mm -hmm. um, so that put a little bit of comfort on me adding some other things to my accolades. Also, with the with the um, the Carifta Games, the reason too that race was so important to me because again I was up against Carl McPherson. Carl mm -hmm. McPherson wanted to to show the world that you know he was ready to yeah and willing and that he was the better athlete. And the reason why I felt so good about that race, even though the time wasn't the best, I was able to pull deep within. And, and conquer my fears because I tell you, I never liked running against Carl McPherson because he was that good. You know, also, you may not say it, but even my Olympic medals is something that was important to me because when I look back at history, Coach Mincy, I realized that the last Olympic medal we had was with Herb McKinley in right, 1952. Right. And so far, it took a man like me who was hungry to break that mold. So, you know, those are some of my greatest accomplishments personally because of what I set out to achieve for myself. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, segue into when you left the shores of Jamaica to go to university. Um, delve into that a little bit for us. Well, I, as I said before, I wasted a lot of time at Excelsior, so I really did not get my subjects and as a result, I had to go to a community college. It was the perfect opportunity for me because when I went to that community college, one of the things I was able to do was to, to, to get more discipline. There was a lot of things that were new to me. So the community college opportunity helped me to develop physically and mentally. I started running fast at the right time. And as a result, it also gave me the confidence. I was heavily recruited and from competing for Central Arizona, I had the confidence to do almost anything I wanted to do. And it worked. You know, I wasn't burnt out. I was maturing slowly but surely. I had the confidence. I was able to put my academics together. I was getting good grades. So it was a perfect opportunity for me. In fact, it was a way for me to redeem myself again because I wasted my time in high school at Excelsior. All right, so walk, 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 walk us through those moments going to training <laughs> and have to be going to class and all these things. T tell us about those experiences. Well, I tell you this, Coach Minzi. The first time, uh, one of the first few times I went out to train, I couldn't handle the workout. You know, the transition was so difficult because of how the coach was actually organizing the practice. We had short rest. We had over distance to do. And I really wasn't good at it. And I could tell in the coach's eyes that he was thinking, maybe they sent me a scrub because this guy just couldn't finish the workout. But the good thing about it is I was a fighter and I was willing to do the work. So I started to liaison with my coach back in Jamaica, Coach White, who is now at Mona High School. Uh, he was at Calabar for a while. And I started to to ask for help until I was fit enough. So the thing about it, for me, I am not afraid, I'm not ashamed to ask for help. My goal was always to, when I get into a new environment, figure out what I need to do, get it done, and with time, the success would come, and it did come. So so essentially, the, the, you couldn't basically manage the workout after being such a, a good athlete here in Jamaica. But you handled the transition well. And it was good that you could have communicated with your, your, your previous coach back at home 
and uh, I mean, <laughs> you 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 would have been helped along the way. I see one well, of our one of our erudites in in the in in the in the comment section is is throwing some shades because he's a color bar man. <laughs> he's saying that Excel does not really produce colors, you know, and the color bar must be somewhere in the story. <laughs> well, tell him that tell him I'm a son of Herb, so we can take the credit because Herb is one of Honorable Herb McKinley was one of my mentors, so. You know, yes, he yes. believed in me when a lot of people didn't. But right, the truth right. of the matter is, Coach Minzy, when I left Excelsior, I was still raw in terms of I was still young and, I, and my body wasn't fully developed. So when mm -hmm. I went to Central Arizona, the coach saw me running some fast times, but he did not realize that I was still new to the thing. Right. It was two years since I was running. So your training so age is, is I young. I needed some time to develop. Right, your training age was actually young. It wasn't at a point where you know you were seasoned in the thing. Definitely, you know what I mean. Definitely. But but after 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 leaving university, I noticed you were coached by one of the world renowned four hundred meter specialist in mm -hmm. Clyde Hart. Yeah. Not only that, you trained with the Superman at that time, Michael Johnson. Yes. I want you to talk to us about training with Johnson, and I want you to talk to us about how did that connection come about in training with Clyde Art? Yeah, well, in, in 1996, I finished fourth at our national trials. And I thought, you know, finishing third the year before, that I would be that man to represent Jamaica. So when I finished fourth, I really didn't get the chance to run the individual event. So I was a little bit broken and it took a while for me to accept the fact that there were three other guys that were performing better. So it took me three years to get over <laughs> that depression. So even though I was there competing, I really wasn't at my best. And I was looking for a place to go. And my agent at the time, Tessa Sanderson, said, you know what, let us ask Coach Hart if he would take you in and whatever, if he don't, we just find somewhere else to go. So she made the call, she made the pitch and Coach Hart said, look, I've watched Hart run over the years. When he was in college, he was beating a couple of my Baylor guys. It would be a pleasure to have him there. So I, in fact, I was one of the first foreigner, per, so to speak, to get the opportunity to train with Mike. Now, when it comes to training with my coach, Minzy, the man, I have never seen another man more disciplined than Mike. The guy was committed to the end. Even though I thought I was committed and I was disciplined, I was nothing compared to what he used to do. He was never late. He was always on time. He knew exactly what he needed to do. And we were kind of learning the event, but Mike was a master at it because he was doing it for so long. And Coach Hart and him, they had a, 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 a union that it was pure. So for me, the only thing I could do was to do my best to get as much knowledge as possible from them. And, in, you know, it took a while for me to really grasp the knowledge but, you know, at the end of the day, I am always grateful for Coach Hart and Mike Johnson for giving me that opportunity because I won a few medals under their tutelage. Right. Uh, back, back in training, you ever used to beat him on the 60 meters or on the turn or the, the 350s or the, <laughs> the, the 450s? <laughs> Mike's weakness was the distance. So I could beat him on the 500s and the 600s. But when it comes to the shorter sprint... Ah, he, he was deadly. He was fast. He was strong. He was efficient. It was hard to beat. And one of the things I found training with Mike is that I was exerting way more energy than him to keep up with him because of his speed. And he was very knowledgeable, very disciplined, very aware. So it was hard for me to beat him when it counted the most because he had the tools, everything, the team of people around him. It was very hard. But, but, but by the way, I'm just I, I'm jumping the gun though. But in terms of the medals that you won on the on the world championship scene and um, the Olympics, was he the one who won those gold medals? I'm trying to drag my uh, there. Well, he won at '96. 
In 90, yes. So he won 95, right. he won 96, he won mm -hmm. 97, he won. Right, right, right. Yeah, 2000. All right. And, and, and since you are there, talk to us about the Olympics. You had three Olympic medals. Yes. Two at one Olympics, an individual one, and mm -hmm. the two others are a part of the relay setup. Yes. Tell us about that experience uh, repping Jamaica in, 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 in the Olympic Games, a big worldwide game, you know, the feeling to, 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 to even go on the podium. Just tell us about the experience, man. Well, I tell you, 20, 1996 was my first Olympic Games in Atlanta. And as I said, I was the weak link on the team. We had a very good team. I think we had a chance to win. It would, it, it, it would be very competitive, but we had a chance because we had two guys, Davian and Roxbert Martin, made the finals of the 400. So we had a very good team. Um, so we really wanted to win that race. We wanted a medal more so. But, you know, unfortunately, I got tripped up taking the baton from Roxbert Martin, and it cost us that, that race. But because it was my first Olympics, I wanted a medal so bad that I really didn't care what I got, which, you know, I'm grateful that I end up winning the, the bronze in the 4x4. Four four. But in terms of 2000, that medal means so much to me because of the things that I had to go through to, to get that medal. A lot of people don't know that we as athletes, sometimes we had personal issues and I was overwhelmed with personal issues. And while I was in Sydney, there was a lot of things going on. I felt tired. I felt drained. I remember before even my race, I went into um, the bathroom and I started to cry because of the issue. That's what how overwhelming it was. And I remember I took a show and just wiped the tears and decided that, look, I am going out there today and I'm going to kill everybody that I get a chance to kill in terms of my performance. And you could see it in the final. I got out hard. I thought I could win, but I fell short because I used up too much energy too soon. First individual Olympic medal, my only individual Olympic medal. That moment was like, like heaven for me because when I think about the things that I had to do and sacrifice to get there, you know, I really was pleased with myself for sticking to the, the task. Not here, no. Sorry about that. Yes, I, I can know. imagine going to your first Olympic in 96 and had that... Um... Uh, probably miss out on an individual medal and so forth. Um, the journey would have started the, the, the very day that event ended. And um, you went into your four-year cycle, probably put in a lot of training. And as you said, you might have a, um, some personal issues dealing with. So I, I, I can imagine how you'd feel to know that this time around, I've gotten that individual medal. It Definitely. must be a good feeling for you. Definitely. Because... A lot of times when you see an athlete on the podium and you see the tears running down their face, we are saying to ourselves that we did not quit. We could have quit like a lot of people, but we stuck with it, you know, and it's a feeling we can describe because each person will describe it in a different way. But for, for most athletes, I would say it is the pinnacle of our accomplishments because when you look at how many individuals have an individual Olympic medal, you see that it is a small amount. Sure. You know, so for me, I am forever grateful for that. But by the way, you have that medal, we can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ask me to do too much. I have to go upstairs and go oh. in the and all of them things there. I will if I work that. <laughs> it, it's somebody, somebody in the comment section asked, but it, people hear so much that medal means to, to, to Dr. Orton. The man <laughs> have it in a safe lockdown. Yes, <laughs> you can't man. touch it. Thank all right. <laughs> so, I mean, after winning that, that, that bronze medal, I, I, the adrenaline probably starts to rush and you probably um out there encouraging the other teammates to, to, to go out in that four by four what was it like going out in that four by four hundred meters well um in know, sydney you know unfortunately for us davian clark got injured in the semi-final because he was in such great shape mm -hmm. that would have been an easy 
gold medal for us. So we were a little sad to know that Davian could have helped the team to achieve a whole lot more and he wasn't there. But at that time, we had a whole lot of good reserve because we had we had Michael McDonald, we had Michael Blackwood. Mm -hmm. In fact, we end up using Christopher Williams. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we had, a, and we had Danny McFarlane and myself. So we had more than enough. In fact, I think we had Brandon Simpson as well yes, that we yes. could have used on that team. So it was a good, it was a good experience for all of us. But I, 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 I guess the, the team meeting would have been that you wanted to go out and win. But um, I, I think United States beat you in that race. Yes, in fact, the Nigerian. So it was the US, then the Nigerian. The Nigerian actually caught Danny right on the wire. Um, I think they were chasing the Bahamians, and we luckily finished third. Chris Brown ended up falling way short, and we ended up finishing third in that race. Eventually, they, 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 they moved us up after the mm -hmm. Pettigrew incident, and they said that we now have a silver medal, silver medal based on okay. that yes okay awesome awesome all right now back to the uh, world championship um um days um you ran at world championship as well and you got medals tell us yeah. about those experiences well in 1995 and um in 1995 i was a junior in college i was proud of myself i was the ncaa champion at that moment mm -hmm. so i was confident going into sweden that it was mine to give up because i was i was very confident i was running great i had a good team of people around me and i just wanted to compete so the good thing about it is the us had four top guys and they were expecting to sweep the 400 meter again Mm -hmm. So, you know, a little Jamaican guy from brought the art, <laughs> you know, so that was good because if you, if you look at even my semi-final, I, I dominated the semi-final, um, for the final, you know, a little bit of mistakes, but I was able to finish the race strong and I won my first individual world championship medal. I'm very proud of that. Very pleased with that performance. And that one is in Lachan and Kia. All right? of them, Lachan <laughs> And people, you ran a time of 44.56 seconds in that yes. event. Yes. Good, good run um, at, uh, at that event. Um, 97. Mm -hmm. Greece. Yes. So, 97, of course, means it. it was that year, too, that I was going through my own little challenge. As I said, I took 96 so hard that it was hard for me to stay focused. Mm -hmm. And also, my body just wasn't holding up. One of the things I found with 400 meter course means is that if you're lucky, you get three good years. If you have knowledge in terms of the training, you can get more like a Michael Johnson. But what I found is that most of us, we, we, we run so hard and we deplete so much of our nutrients that we are not able to replicate that performance. And I think that too played a major role in my career because for 96 97 98 was a very tough year for me and i started coming back bouncing back again 99 and 2000 so 97 i was i finished fourth at the trial i was on the mile relay team um we finished third again uh, we had a very good team uh, but we finished third again and again we were bumped up to second because of mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. incident and you also went to the world indoors as well in Paris. Yes, we finished second that second year. Second in that event, yes. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, 98 is where you 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 won a goal at the Commonwealth game in the four by four. Yes. How, how, that, how was that Commonwealth for you? That was good enough because again, 98, I started finding my footing. I made the Commonwealth final. I was the top Jamaican there. Um, so the, really, we were confident that we could not lose. Regardless of what they said, we had a very strong team. Davian Clark, Roxbert Martin, um, myself, I forgot who the third person, the fourth person was. But we had a solid team. We won the race from the get-go. And again, that's my only Commonwealth Games medal. And I am happy that that is a goal. Mm -hmm. And you know... 
in, in those times, you know, we, 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 we always say we can depend on our, our relay team to act, uh, at least bring back a medal. Because so you, 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 you gentlemen were, were, were awesome, you know. Even though you had to run in a time when the U.S. had so, so many talent in that event. U.S. basically used to dominate that event, um, if you ask me. So it was good to know that even with those um, plethora of runners by, from the U.S., you, 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 you gentlemen always find a way to eke out a medal in you the know, one of the thing, One of the things he coached means, if you look at it, um, it was the same crop of guys from 1993 all the way up to around 2001. Uh, just, we could say 2000. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the team had then was unity. We were honest with each other. If you notice, if you look at the team, you will see that sometimes I would run the first leg, I would run the third leg, I would run the anchor leg, depending on what we needed to do. Danny McFarlane, he could run any leg we could. So the team had oneness. And we would sit and discuss who should run what. Mm -hmm. And we were honest with each other because we wanted to win. And I yes. think for that seven years, that is the main reason we were so successful as a team. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And I, I, I salute you, gentlemen. But um, you, 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 you finished off your career in, in, in which year again? Remind 2000, us. 2000 and uh, I would say three, 2004. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at that time, you were still living in the U.S. And what propelled you to uh, go back into the classroom? To, well, to, to um, pursue your studies, uh, PhD well, studies. I always, I was always in the classroom because even when I was running, I was doing my MBA okay. because I knew that there would be a transition from from running. Life and I didn't want to be country. like some of the people who struggled to find their way, and because I had the resources at the time, the money to pay for these courses and stuff i had no mm -hmm. issue because i knew it was investing in myself mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. i was always a teacher because everywhere i go i used to encourage people i used to show people how to increase their awareness so for me being in the classroom is just something i think that comes natural okay and um you made mention of your 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 well, well we made mention of your mentoring um program that you you have Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about that, uh, what it entails, who does it cater to, is, mm -hmm. only, is it only athletes or whosoever may? Okay, and uh, I like that question, Coach Minzi. But before you answer that question, I overlooked a question there in the comment. Uh, Jay Ham is asking if you keep in contact with Devon Morris. You know, I'll tell you the story about Devon Morris. Is uh, I called him a couple of times, left a few messages. I didn't get him. Um, but I remember the first time Devon Morris saw me at the National Stadium. I was, a, I, was a, I was a young guy. I wasn't even on a Jamaica team yet. And for some reason, he gave me a pair of Reebok spikes. I love that spikes. You know, but I was saying to myself, this guy saw something in me that I didn't even see it myself. Yes, yes. So because of that, I always think about him because for somebody to 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 show you some 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 care without you even asking, it was something that I cherish. So you know, I really hope because I never got the chance to sit with him and tell him thank you for that spikes and the fact that when he won the world indoors, it was an inspiration to me too. I never had the chance to talk with him face to face to tell him that I really appreciate what he did for me when I was a junior. Okay, awesome. And sorry to, to cut your thoughts from that uh, <laughs> the initial question, but let's get back into the um, conversation of the mentorship Mentoring. program. Yes. Right. So, so the mentorship came about Coach Menzi, because in my life, I made a lot of mistakes. You know, some of them, I would say they weren't intentional. I wanted the best for myself. I trusted some people. I lost a lot of money along the way. Um, a lot of things happened to me along the way. And because of that, I wanted to help athletes mainly to 
be able to plan better, to have people that they could trust. And because of that, I started to mentor athletes even before I, I opened the Heart and the Mentoring group. Um, and I saw where a lot of them, the athletes, there were some void that needed to fill. And a lot of times they were not aware of it. And because of that, the people with the knowledge usually take advantage of them. And we usually find out when it is too late. We usually find out when we lose all of our resources. We usually find out when we are not young again, so we are not able to produce on the track. So it was always my goal to open up a mentoring program where I could reach out to athletes. So far, one of the things I never usually do is to talk about some of the people that I mentor because of privacy. But they already come out. Some of them talk about it. Megan Tapper, Jason Morgan, Kenya Sinclair, Aileen Bailey, a lot of Jamaican athletes. I mentor some Americans too because it's not about my own people. I find that a lot of athletes, regardless of where they are, that they are faced with similar situations that I found myself in. And because of that, I made sure that when we put together Heart and Mentoring Group, that it is one that would be honest with people. It is one that will show people the right way to do things. And the good thing about it, Coach Minzi, we provide that support mechanism that they need. And that is something that they all should have. Yes, and, and you, you touch a very um, salient point there, Doc, uh, because athletes sometimes don't have the support system around them. Or I could say positive, not all of them. Especially if some don't have a shoe sponsorship and they have to be fending on their own and all of these things. So that, that, that's a very, very, very good point that you touched on. These athletes oftentimes need these things. And, and we the, congratulate you on doing something like this. You know the thing that I keep seeing, because I mentor a lot of them, I know the personal issues. And one of the things I find that a lot of the athletes, they are not even making enough attempt to, to get that level of support and knowledge. I'll tell you one of my biggest mistakes that I made, that I see athletes today are making. They put everything over to their team, where their team now would use them, their abilities, to make all the contacts. Contact with shoe company, contact with managers, contact with with endorsement companies, and they have no information and our awareness to say that, look, when I finish run, I have no contacts. All of my contacts would go to somebody else and you're just naked, left out there with nothing. You can't take up your phone and call the manager or the owner for Pepsi because you don't have it. And you never build a relationship with these individuals. So mm -hmm. you are a nobody when you finish running. And, and I'm, when I say nobody, Coach Minzi, if you look at most of our athletes who, who retired, look at where they are. Some of them are so bitter. Some of them are upset because they realize that they cannot turn back the hands of time and undo mm -hmm. some of the mistakes that they made. Yeah, and the right. thing that upset me a lot is that I see young athletes today doing the exact same thing. And you just have to wait until they retire to find that out. So, 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 like your mentorship program, um, as what you said, you see some young athletes heading down that channel. But is it okay? Is it a situation where you would probably reach out to some of these persons and try to get them on board on on your program or your group? Well, or you just wait until they're finished competing? Well, one of the things I do, Coach Pinzi, is I am not biased or selfish with my information. I let it out there. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, who want it will find it and who are seeking will find it. One of the things I find with a lot of our Jamaican athletes too, and this is not to criticize in any way, but one of the things I find with them is that they are not open. They are not open to receive. And the reason for that is that their handlers in most cases are afraid to, to let them have more access to the outside world because they feel that if they allow these athletes to start to experience new things that they may rob, be robbed from them. And as a result of that, to protect them, they try to hold on to all the information 
And at the end of the day, I oftentimes say to the athletes, your agent can, can, can represent hundreds of athletes after your time. Your coach will coach hundreds of athletes after you retire. And it keep going on and on. So at the end of the day, I, I am 100% honest, 100% transparent with my people. I make them know the pros and the cons to decision. I don't make decisions for them. But what I do, I will show them the possibilities, the pros and the cons to the decision and leave it up to them to make that final decision for themselves. Okay, awesome. So at the end of the day, is 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 basically to lead them in, in a path where they are able to make a, a, a decision that will aid them in becoming a better individual after track and the field. Right. And one of the things we also do, and uh, it, it is my team, my team of people, my team of doctors, my team of psychiatrists, all of my team, they have access to my team. So it is also based on the individual needs. If the athlete needs something, we make sure that the people that we we put them to are the best in the business. I can tell you this course means they are not one of them to boast, but mm -hmm. our accuracy rate is 99.9. .9. When we sit together and make a decision that is in the best interest of the athlete, we never miss because we take everything into account and we have the minds that when we sit around a table, we discuss everything. That and is I guess, why we are so successful. And, and, I, and I, 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 so I, I am thinking with your experience as a past athlete, it goes a long way around that boardroom table. Definitely. Because it Definitely. will help for you to understand how the athletes are feeling, what they are coming with, and all of these things. And then the professional side of it now will be able to assist them in the way that they ought to be assisted. So Definitely. And one of the things we try to say, even to the coaches, the managers, and the parents, and whosoever, that we are never here to take away anything from them, take away any spotlight from them. What we want is to make the athlete better. If the athlete is better, the agent benefits, the mm -hmm. coach benefits, their family benefits. So All the goal and is to see the athletes achieve his or her highest potential. That's our number one priority. <laughs> Simple. Okay. Okay, that's awesome. But do, do you do you uh, mentor like amateur athletes as well as professional athletes? Yes, I do. But I am very selective with the people that I bring on board. And, we, okay. and the reason for that, Coach Menzi, because a lot of athletes are not ready to be mentored. Mm -hmm. uh, they come with their own way. And once I go through my preliminaries and I realize that this is not a good candidate, I do not take them on. We are mm -hmm. about and again, it's not about talent. It's not about how talented you are. It's about mm -hmm. how committed you can be. It's about how willing you are to achieve what you set out to achieve. Awesome. And can you tell the people how, how, how they can sign up to this thing or, or how they, how can they get in contact with you? Or is it that you outsource um, these athletes? You can find me on heartmentoringgroup.com. You can find me on Facebook. I, um, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, once you reach out, we will make sure that we get a hold of you. I'm also proud to say that come next year, we have the HMG Academy where we are, we have already produced um, four top quality courses, the mind of a champion, mental training, because we realize that not a lot of athletes today are focused on mental training. We have overcoming your fear a lot of times we as athletes want to achieve so much but our fears are in our way that is one of the flagship um, courses that i truly like the third one that i will tell you that i love is how to achieve your highest potential in the 400 meters we break down everything that you need to know about being the best 400 meter runner you can be and come next year, we are ready to launch the HMG Academy. <laughs> All right. So you're, you're, you're basically opening an academy that will cater to 400 meter athletes or just athletes, athletes. overall? Athletes. So we do personal development too. 
So once you go to the academy, you will see everything that you need in terms of um, overcoming your fear, um, achieving your highest potential. We are just slowly making these courses and rolling them out when the time is right. All right. We have um, attorney Murphy online. He, he decided to call <laughs> in because he wanted uh, to ask you a question. Go ahead, um, Sir Murphy, you are live. Yes, 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 coach. Bless up, bless up, bless up. Brother Harton. Yes, sir. You can run, but you can't hide in there. You cannot escape from a G surveillance system. So, um, but I just wanted to say, hey, for you two guys, this is like a blitzing in disguise. I didn't even know that this was going to happen because coach, this is something where I actually call him today to talk about this thing. Like, yo, you need to get on the, coach, the coach's desk thing. And then I looked at my alert, and I saw that he was going to be on. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to watch the thing work its way out. But it's a blessing. It's a joy. Um, you know, this, 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 oh, this, this guy is one of the most important friends I have. Um, lots of knowledge. Um, but more importantly, um, his, his heart and his mind in his, is in a good place when it comes to uh, our Jamaican athletes and the things that they are deficient in. Because I think in our country, one of the things that uh, the powers that be lack is vision. We feel like if we let our athletes grow, we lose them. And that's, 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 that's not true. I mean, if you, if you ever want somebody to get to the best of their potential, you got to give them room to grow. You got to be there to nurture and guide, but you got to give them room to grow. Uh, and so, but I just, I mean, I enjoy this program thoroughly. Um, man, this, this, this like literally warms my heart, man. Blessings to both of y'all and hey, Godspeed. All right. Thanks much, um, Sir Murphy. Big up yourself again. All right. All right. Cool. All right. So, sir, you see, um, Doc, you're reaching far enough. Um, we're going to be taking some, some questions um, from the um, comment section. But I, 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 I applaud you on that academy that is coming up. We normally hear about football academy. <laughs> we have never heard of a track and field academy. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to, to, to hearing more on that. And we probably could bring you back here when, when things um, start off for, for you to give us um, a little insight on what is happening where that is concerned. Definitely. All right. Most All right. Definitely. So, all right, cool. So we have a question coming in from the comment section from Jay Ham. He said he's the cousin of Devon um, that he asked about. Or was it Devon? Devon Morris. Yes, Devon Morris. Right, right. So he's saying that what is your take, uh, Dr. Orton, on the men's team going into next year's world games in the US? You know, a lot before you answer, a lot have been said about our male sprinting that um you know, it is not at the place that it ought to be post Usain Bolt era. So I want you to talk to us about um, that in, in terms of the question that was asked. Well, I, I put out some videos recently and it, 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 we, we, we break that down in segments to say that the talent has always been there. There are some things that are missing and it is the culture that is, or I should say, the ever-changing culture that is causing our young men to settle. You know, I had an interview with even um, uh, with Michael, and he made it absolutely clear that some of the young guys, they are not focused enough. They get a few things, and they think that they are there. So that, too, is interfering with their ability to perform at their best. And we, it's, the sad thing about it is, that we see this throughout the events, the 100, the 200, uh, the 400. We even see it among the hurdles. So my thing is this, and this is why I have the, the academy too, because mm -hmm. everybody's focusing on the physical aspect, but no one seems to want to focus on the mental aspect. Everything that we do, every successes that I was able to, to gain, it wasn't because of my physical talent, well, physical count, but it was also about my awareness, my knowledge. And this is something that I want to bring to Jamaica because I have been one of the first to say, look here, guys, 
let us put in place a mental training program at the grassroots level because a lot of these wow. older guys athletes they are they do have bad habits and the principles that they are using to govern their life these are outdated things so if we want to produce great athletes it starts with the grassroots where we implement the mental training program throughout the country i keep getting a lot of pushback you know right before the pandemic coach minzy i came to jamaica i did 14 schools um throughout clarendon i went to veer i went to garvey maceo i went to a lot of schools trying to get them to implement the mental training i see all the issues that they have and i always say this coach minzy that if our federation and 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 others don't do something we're going to find it hard to win one or two medals because we are losing our talents because of the ever-changing culture the lack of discipline the lack of structure the lack of funding the lack of support within the system and we cannot expect that these at least gonna find the solution on their own it takes creative mind and effort in order to put in place a system that they too can benefit from uh, that's 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 well said because you know jamaicans really neglect the 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 aspect of sports which i believe is very important and that aspect is a mental aspect um not many teams there's a, a psychologist that travels with the team you know the these aspect that are uh, that i believe as 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 you are sharing very 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 vital sometimes especially at the, at, at, at the young athletes age they have different things dealing with and then they come to training and you want the best from them while they have underlining issues dealing with and you probably not trained as the coach to deal with these issues so i i do agree with you that the, the mental aspect of of of, of physical of, of training is 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 and i will say is important so it's a good thing that you're doing. And I, I, I say to you, don't give up on, on, on trying again. Because, you know, when persons come with something new, it, there's always a pushback initially. But once you can garner a success story from what you are bringing forth, trust me, mm -hmm. you will have, you will not have hands and personals to deal with these issues. You know Here what I mean? You want the matter, Coach Minzy. If we are going to take a psychiatrist or a psychologist with the team sometime it's too late and this is why we said because remember you know mm -hmm. what are the things that are affecting the athletes from performing at their highest potential Optimal. exactly exactly it is it is personal issues mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, <laughs> you know? and you shared it because like <laughs> i said you remember i said earlier you had experience as an athlete you know you had a year when you were supposed to be doing well and you had personal issues. So you're you you have you you're close to situations like these. Definitely. And I, trust me, go ahead. Definitely. Definitely. You know, this might not be the right time to say, it, but a few years ago we reached out to a, a, a few organizations in Jamaica with the hope to bring forth new ideas and new ways of solving the problem. One of the things I find with our people in Jamaica is that they always think that when you come with a solution, that you come with your hands out, hoping that they would give you something. I've always said this in a coach, Minty. A Greg Horton has achieved everything independently, even though we got help. But this time, as attorney uh, Murphy would say, it's not about us taking anything from them. It's about us giving them something that will actually make them look better. It is actually helping that vulnerable population in terms of the athletes who are not able to help themselves. So I can make it clear on your platform to say, I don't want anything from them. I am here to give back. Whether they are on our team or not, we're going to do it because it is something that means a lot to us. 
and we're going to do it with or without their help. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. I am, I am lost for words. I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost for words because this this is really touching, really touching. But as you said, you'd have achieved so much in the sport independently as well. And you want to give back, and there's there's a pushback when when it comes on to things like these. But I, I will say it again: uh, don't stop, keep pushing, because I think that mentality that you would have used while being an athlete. If that spills over, you know, nobody should be able to resist <laughs> this thing, you know. <laughs> yes, man. Because you would have said it earlier that, I mean, you you, you weren't one to, to, to quit. You know what I mean? Um, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so you believe that our, our crop of 400-meter of athletes, you think they can take on the world the, the, the new blood that is coming up you think they can compete with, the, with those ones out there right now i've said it before um the, like the akeem bloomfield and the nathan allen started mm -hmm. to, to 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 do great things i met with them talked with them mm -hmm. and in terms of raw talent they are more talented than us you can see they are faster athletes than us. Yes, yes. They are bigger athletes than us. They are stronger. You can tell. But one thing that they lack is that level of awareness. And they lack the strategy. That is a mental thing. Strategy is not just a physical absolutely, thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I've always said it. Now, I talked with Chris Taylor last Sunday. Beautiful interview with him. And I realized, too, that he has the mind of a champion. But at the end of the day... My hope is that they don't lose focus somewhere along the line. And this is why when you have an, a group of athletes that like we have now in Jamaica, that we support them. We find out what they need and we make sure that the mental things that will make them better, that they have it. Because sometimes I can tell you, Coach means it's not about money. Sometimes they don't need money. What they need is the right information at the right time the right strategy at the right time and that will give them that level of confidence to execute their races perfectly and that is what we're missing here with our 400 meter group of guys sorry about that like i said like you said it has to be mental because these youngsters are not short on talent they are very talented you know what i mean so, I mean, if, if, if they can get to a place where they can contact you and your team, I mean, we are looking to have some world beaters um, next season. Another question coming in. Um, what is your view on the athletes staying locally versus going overseas to train? Well, if you look at the history, and I always say, if you want to make a decision... You can always look at the past and then you can use the past to guide your future. Not every one of us should stay in Jamaica and not every one of us should go. Some people who lack the discipline, it best they stay home and try to keep that support. Because you find that a lot of the people who leave Jamaica and end up losing a scholarship was because of lack of discipline, um, lack of commitment and so on. I think that since funding has been a major issue, and I've done several interviews asking about funding and how are we going to fund these programs. I've interviewed coaches and the coaches are telling you that the hardest part of surviving is funding. Uh -huh. Now, the truth of the matter is that when we send our athletes overseas, the United States pick up the bill because what they do is they help to develop the talent one of the things we find in a lot of these, in a lot of these um, uh, clubs is that you have an athlete for two, three years. If the athlete don't produce, you dump that athlete and you look for someone else. Within that two to three years, that athlete could have been properly developed overseas. And if that athlete no want to come home, then that athlete would have or should have the right. So my thing is this. We sit we think about who should go and why. We talk about who should stay and why. 
And then you make that decision based on the individual needs that the athlete has. And uh, there's also a notion of, of some of these athletes who, who does well at, at the Boys and Girls Championship after they finish high school persons are looking for them to make the immediate transition into the senior ranks do you do you do you subscribe that they must become a, a world beater or some just they love it do it at high school and that's it for them you see coach Minze, i live this so i can tell you all these things with my eyes closed because again i mentor i mentor athlete i see the history and I am saying to you that a lot of the times when we keep retain our athletes, it is out of selfish needs. We are not thinking about the best interest of the athletes. Because if we were thinking about the best interest of the athletes, we would give the athlete the right time to develop. And, and, and if you go back in time, you will see even Mr. Mills said it, that it was good for some of the athletes to go. And yeah. he said it, that funding has been a major issue for the athletes so when you retain an athlete who need funding and you don't have the funds to properly develop that athlete it means yeah. that you're putting your personal needs before the athlete needs and one of my philosoph philosophy course means is this if you do what is best for the athletes then the coach benefits the club benefits etc etc but mm -hmm. what we find is that people are seeing the athletes including myself when I used to run, as the prize. And the prize is not for us. The prize is really to develop, develop us for them. And this is where it gets really tricky, Coach Minzi, where if the athlete don't have the awareness and the knowledge, they will continue to make poor decisions that will affect their ability to become the best version of themselves. Okay, awesome. Um, how come you didn't tell us, Doc, that you disseminated Michael Johnson's indoor NCAA 400 meter record? Well, <laughs> I just got a little a, a, little, a message well, on my phone. <laughs> well, 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 put it this way, Coach Minzy, because you know I have a lot of people who study my history, and for some reason they kept saying that when they compare the things that I did during my career, mm -hmm. there is no other 400 meter Jamaican 400 meter runner alive that has done what I did. But for some reason, my accomplishments have not been <laughs> shared with the public. The second time I ran indoor, I broke the NCAA record. So, again, winning championships individually and team. The first Jamaican to get a medal after 52 years is now since 20 odd years. You know, recently mm -hmm. I heard the prime minister said that the last person who made it was 17 years ago. But when you look at medals, the last time we had a medal, other than myself, it would make it 70 odd years we won our first Olympic medal in the 400. And the only person who got a medal since then is, is myself. And this is why when we talk about the ever-changing culture, Coach Minzi, we are saying that it is important to teach these young athletes who came before you so they understand the path that they need to travel. Some of them are blindly in it and they don't know. And when you know, like for me, I know everything about Bert. I know everything about the Honorable Herb McKinley. I know about George Roden. I know about Arthur Wynn because I strive to be like them in every way. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you need to share with us, man, what, what happened in that race. Were you going at the record or, or, or you, you were just running and enjoying yourself? Well, I, I made a mistake when I was younger where um, I started to focus on time. Anytime you're in a race and you start to think about time, 
you're never going to execute the race to the best of your ability. So after running that race poorly because I wanted a record, I made the decision that, look, each time I run again, it would be to execute to the best of my ability. I will not focus on time. I will not focus on place. I'll just go out there and do my best. And that's how I've been running ever since. Okay, great, great. Um, somebody insists that, the, the, this Calabar individual insists that you answer this question. You know, if you had a <laughs> golden spike, like what um, Mike, Mike had, Mike Johnson. Who, me? Yes. No, the only golden spike I had was what Mike gave me. He gave me a spike, but I did not have my own spike. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> All right, another question coming in. Um, um, what do you think about uh, children who stay at school to win champs after winning three years? Well, I, I I just covered that in terms of yeah. This one is, is this one is late. Um, there's another question coming in. What about um that magnificent run after he fell in the four by four relay when he got the baton? We spoke. You spoke on that as well. Yeah, and I will tell you that if I got a chance to do that again, I would just lay down on the ground and just do <laughs> nothing because I tell you. That race took every single thing out of me. I was, I was, if you look at the race, you will see I was dead. When I, when I fell to the ground, the entire wind got knocked out of me. So when I got up, it was just a shell of me running around the track. It was one of the hardest things I have ever done in terms of track and field. I don't think I had the courage and the heart to do it again. I don't think I could. <laughs> Listen to me. 400 is no joke, you know. But I tell you, some of you athletes, um, Dr. Greg, you find some amount of energy and enthusiasm when you have a baton in your hand, you know. Trust me, because when I see you and Davian and Danny running some 4x4, four four, it's a different athlete to see, you know. True. True. Yes, man. Um, any more questions coming in? Let me see. Um, we don't want to keep doctors too too long on here, you know, because we can go very long on this show. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? All right. Um, doc, I think you're you're doing a, a, an absolutely fabulous job where your mentorship program is concerned. And um, hold on. There's a question. CC Sports Lab, you're very late, man. We touch that. We touch on those points, man. You're late. You're, that's why I mustn't come to class late, you know. The teacher will have to rep repeat, and the teacher will be frustrated. <laughs> but you're doing a, a, a good job, and and I'm really looking forward to see what will come of the uh, the academy. Uh, when I hear these things, and you know, I'm very interesting, interested in 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 hearing what will come out of it. You know what I mean? He also spoke of Akeem Bloomfield that he's a very talented athlete. You're really late, man. <laughs> You're really late. <laughs> All right. So, Doc, I want you to, as we close, because I, I'm not seeing any more new questions coming in. Um, oh, yes. The question is, will you publish a book? That's well, so far, question. I have three books out. Uh, the, the one that I would recommend you get is Achieve your highest potential in your career. That book itself is one that I went deep within myself and I, I took out everything in terms of what a person should do in order to achieve the highest success, not just physically, but also um, monetarily. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that you get that. So we have the, the two that I truly enjoy is Achieve Your Highest Potential in Your Career and the seven secrets to a successful career. I would suggest you get them there on Amazon, and Amazon, Amazon okay, etc. Okay, so there, we, there's where you can find the books, people. Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and uh, you can, you know, do your orders and and get those books. All right, a question is coming in. Should Christopher Taylor stick to four hundred meters and two hundred meters? Well, you know, I we we had a discussion with Chris on Sunday and. So far, I think he's on the right track in terms of making sure that he's fully fit 
Because one of the things he said that his coach wanted him to do is to trust the process. Because in order to sprint, it is best for you to be strong enough where you're not going to injure yourself. Exactly. And I think the coach is aware of that. And he can use the, the, the 400 meter training and races him to build him up. So when it's time for him to run the 200, at least he has the fundamental, the foundation in place. Yes, man, absolutely. That that's that's a good um take to it. Uh Donnell Holland is saying that uh, thanks for getting up and running after that fall. That race had me um fall in love with track and field at the age of twelve. Big up yourself. Wow, wow. <laughs> you see, sometimes you don't know what to do that is inspiring someone in a dock. That so, is so true. I mean um Jay Ham is saying I think Christopher um Taylor should select one of the two and focus on that. All right, but the answer was given just now by Doc. All right, Doc, I want you to um, share your final thoughts. Um, I want you to also tell the people where they can find you on various social uh, media platforms. And please remember, people, he, he also has a channel, Let's Talk with Dr. Greg Orton. So you can also check out his contents over there on his channel. Importantly, support the Jamaicans. Right? Go ahead, Doc. Oh, but before you you take that on, um, CC Sports Love is asking if you ever approach to be in the social studies book, so our kids can learn about you as well as the other greats. <laughs> no, not at all. All right, go ahead, Doc. Share some words of encouragement uh, to some of the young athletes out there, and athletes in general. Or just people in general before we, we close up. And again, tell them where we can find you on sure. various social media platforms. Sure. Uh, one of my dreams is to be able to see all athletes achieve their highest potential, even at the same time. I want us to start thinking about each other and not ourselves. We find where a lot of the leaders who are to take better care, guide our young athletes, that they are thinking about themselves. We can achieve a whole lot more as a nation if we start putting the best interests of the athletes. Because without the athletes, you don't have a coach, you don't have anybody to manage. Um, so it is important that we now start to put things in place that can help these young, vulnerable population of athletes to properly develop. Again, I am inspired because the Honorable Herb McKinley reached out to me, helped me to find myself. And because of that, and it wasn't done by any selfish gains or means in any way, it was because he saw a young man with the talent and the, the, and the drive who wanted to achieve something and had the mental and the physical ability to do so. As a nation, let us do so. All the organization, let us do so. And I appreciate what you have done, Coach Minzi, because you reached out to me and together we should make this a team where we try to uplift and elevate those who we see are striving to achieve their highest potential. And this is why even with the Let's Talk, it's about giving young and developing athletes a voice, an ear, somewhere where they can come out and speak how they feel and tell the world who they are because no one seemed to care enough exactly, to want exactly. to do it. So I appreciate what you have done. Um, I can be found. I uh, have my YouTube channel. Let's talk with Dr. Greg. You can find me on Facebook. Everything is linked on Instagram. Um, Facebook, you can go to Heart and Mentoring Group. You will see everything, all my contact information, all my website, everything that you need to get a hold of me. You can find it on all my social media platforms. Coach means I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And may God continue to bless you and all of your subscribers in everything that you do. Thank you very much, Dr. Greg, for even taking up the opportunity to be here. Because, you know, as stalwart like yourself, you know, as, as you made mention of giving the, the, the athletes a, a, a voice. And this was one of the, um, the thought process of having the track and field interviews on on because you know this is a, a a sports channel we cover football and we also cover track and field 
But I also mm-hmm. wanted to highlight persons like you would have done great things for the country. And we're not limit- limiting it to Jamaicans alone. We, 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 we also want to talk to persons who are basically in track and field. So it's, it's indeed a good look. And um, whenever you need um, a helping and trust me, I'll be, I'll be available. Uh, because as I said, each one needs one and definitely really appreciate the, the sentiments that you share. Um, thanks to the persons who, who came out tonight again this evening to, 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 to be with us, share their thoughts. The persons who have been positively impacted by, by, by Dr. Greg's um, um, interview, I, I trust that you share it. Uh, you like the stream as well. And uh, for persons, you can share it in your if you know anyone who does track and field, you can share it with them so that they can look into the life of this awesome Jamaican who would have represented us with pride and dignity and is also a winner. You know what I mean? So thanks again, people. Big up yourself. And like we always say, stay safe. Until next time, peace out. Your style and your flavor make the city rock. They must say the season come out with a bang. Coach Minzy, best round here. Remember that.